one of the comments that we always hear, um, but I guess on the on the on the battlegrounds of Twitter, on one of the things that you always hear, one of the things, the rumors that you always hear is that um, Satoshi owns a million coins, right? That's the rumor, right? Right. And one of the questions that I always get from people that are going in is, what if he just goes and sell those coins on the top? I, I fundamentally believe no one has access to those coins anymore. And I'm going to tie it up with the Genesis block. The Genesis block, the Bitcoin that's there, a lot of people have donated Bitcoin to there. It's unspendable, right? Right. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that that Bitcoin is is tied up? Do you believe that... 10, 20 years from now, Satoshi's going to go, ha ha, and just dump all his Bitcoin. If, if you've read my article, you know what I think, right? Uh, uh, th those coins will never move. Those coins are a monument that's going to last forever, right? Like nobody will ever be able to touch. Every one of us can see those coins. They're there on the blockchain. They haven't moved. They won't ever move. And they stand there forever. Right? Like for, ever, for anyone anywhere who sinks a note up, or who acts as an explorer, they can see those coins. Um, and as much as they might lust after them or try to hack Bitcoin or try to do anything to them, they cannot touch those coins. And this is, this is again, without spoiling too much of uh, the end of the article, this is what Satoshi did with his money. He didn't use it uh, to buy himself a fancy Lamborghini or to make himself famous or to buy power and influence. He left it as this monument to what he accomplished, which is some of more, more than what I just elucidated about what he, what he did. And, and there it is standing forever. And you can't, you know, it's a price. It, it's a monument that's worth more than all, all than a million Bitcoin. And no matter how much a million Bitcoin is worth in purchasing power, here is a monument that is going to last forever that nobody can destroy, right? Nobody can touch it. It's quite, it's quite amazing. It's about the only indestructible thing in the world. And it's Satoshi's stack of coins. And take it if you can, as I say in the story, but you can't uh, because it's a remnant of the, it's an effect of the invention that he made, an immalleable, indestructible entity. And his coins stand there as a monument to the indestructibility of it and to the creativity and to the generosity and humility that this person who went by the name Satoshi Nakamoto for a couple of years um, represented, <laughs> missing the exact word, right? But that's what he stood for. And, uh, and it's, quite, it's quite remarkable. And it is like the superhero story. Like if you were doing a, a movie that showed the story of whoever Satoshi Nakamoto was, he puts on his cape, he does this heroic deed, and then he disappears and goes off and lives his life however he lives it, but he leaves that whole thing behind. And it becomes, you know, this is probably one of the most well-known brands in the world. He's the creator of the machine that became this brand that became this incredibly well-known brand without ever spending a nickel on marketing. Like he never raised any money for it. He didn't buy an ad campaign for Bitcoin. It just, it's like the people came towards this great invention that was created by a single person anonymously who then abandoned it. And the masses keep getting bigger and bigger and the value of it keeps getting bigger and bigger because people recognize the achievement that this thing uh, of Bitcoin is. And he, le you know, and he resists all temptation to come back and do anything of the sort of spending these coins. There's been so much like, you know, it's not like he's sitting on the brink. It, there were many times in the history of Bitcoin right now where if money or saving bit, even helping Bitcoin was what he wanted to do, he would have come back to do that. But he let it sit in a sense as a test of what was built, right? that it could now stand on its own without its creator's support, uh, but also to continue to exist in that humble way, which is I've done the thing that I came to do whatever it was, right? And it wasn't for money and it wasn't for power and it wasn't for fame. And this is what takes me back to why Bitcoin becomes such a spiritual awakening for people because you can see that heroes really do exist and heroes can accomplish great things that people think are impossible and they don't have to do it for selfish reasons of fame, power, or money. They can do it for making the world a better place and giving a gift to the world. And that's what Satoshi did.
And so it's a really, really extraordinary story with a profound ending, right? <laughs> like just such a deep emotional and meaningful ending to it. Um, and the story goes on, right? Like the Satoshi's part of the story ends, but the story of Bitcoin as this movement that grows of, and everyone who's in it is a volunteer. Nobody is forced at the point of a gun to become a Bitcoiner. It is just other human beings recognizing the freedom that this thing gives, the intelligence, the brilliance of the innovation, the efficacy of this machine to continue to tell the truth and continue to stay true to reality. And so more and more people are attracted to it. Armies of nonviolent, consenting, intelligent, uh, peaceful people are marching towards this invention that could only be made possible because there's nobody in charge of it. So I, I think I've gone on long enough answering your question of how important is Satoshi's story to this. It's, it's crucial. Yeah, and, and it's I, one thing that no other coin, like no other invention, can have it right. No, nobody else can rediscover what he discovered, and nobody else who's attempting to recreate Bitcoin is attempting to do it for any reason but money, power, and fame. Correct. Right. So it's complete opposites in terms of the origin of every one of these alternatives. Absolutely, it had that immaculate conception when it was created. He yes. had no idea that it was going to be worth something. Um, it was all theory. Um, and then natural, naturally, free market forces uh, gave it a value. And then, you know, that's roughly, which is interesting, that's roughly when he disappeared, right? Not too long after. Before. As soon as it had value, yeah. As soon as it had any value, he, he left. And, and it go, I think that really is the testament to say he wasn't in it for the money. He was in it for the freedom, right? To create a money that didn't have somebody in charge of it. To create peer-to-peer -peer electronic trustless cash. And he, and he knew that there was more than just technology to this, right? It, like it was about how it was created and how it was created needed to be something that didn't have somebody in charge of it. How else could it be trustless? And so in that, that's why he had to create the persona of Satoshi Nakamoto who had to disappear. Like he knew all of this at the beginning. He didn't come out and say, I'm, I'm going to disappear. He said, I was Satoshi Nakamoto and we knew he wasn't. But he, the fact that he actually did disappear and did so so quietly, right? Didn't make a big announcement about that either. He didn't. We didn't have a throwing a going away party for Satoshi Nakamoto. He didn't say, uh, "In order for Bitcoin to succeed, I need to disappear." So let's everyone come and say goodbye. I'll have a big receiving line. He just sent an email to one of the developers a few months after and said, "You won't be hearing from me much anymore. I've moved on to other things." And again, without fanfare. It reminds me of, you know, and I always say like when I, I guess it's the closest analogy that I can think of um, or example, better said, um, one of the most important things that George Washington did in America's founding was not to dis not decide to be king. He stepped mm -hmm. away after two terms and then that set mm -hmm. pr a precedent for the rest of American history. You know, right. you could say FDR kind of. You know, but mostly 99, 95 percent yeah. of American presidents stick to that two term basis. And I think it's I think that really set the tone for the United States for so long. And yeah. I think Satoshi perhaps maybe understood that on a fundamental yeah, level. For sure. Create for sure. this and just let it go. I agree. I agree. And, and even to a greater degree. Right. Because he, he found a way to not let somebody else be the leader. He found a way to eliminate rulers from the thing altogether. And so it, it's like, it's the apex. Uh, it, it, it's the apex system of anarchy, right? Or the apex system of no rulers, which is all that anarchy means. And people think it's people, other people running through the streets with machetes, chopping each other's heads off. But it just means, it means rules with no rulers, right? And he created this apex. It's not rules with no long-term rulers. It's not rules with rulers that have term limits. It's rules with no rulers. And the necessary step in order to create that is to not be a ruler yourself. And that and that's hard to do because once you've stepped into a, a leadership role, but for dying, um, people expect you to lead or 
someone else to step into that role when you leave from it, right? It's like there's succession, right? Someone comes in and kills you to succeed. There's an election that happens to succeed you. Some some way people have been looking at a system with the leader and they say, okay, well, this leader's gone. So who's the next leader? They don't say this leader's gone. So now there's no leader. Right? When the president of a company leaves, a new president is... <laughs> they begin looking for someone or they usually try to have a transition period. Satoshi transitioned to no rulers and he did so just by vanishing. Yeah. Uh, so it was quite a remarkable feat. We've never so seen it before. 